On today's episode, NASCAR has an injury problem. There are engineering solutions. Today's episode is brought to you by engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on engineering.com TV today. If you're a fan of NASCAR, and even if you're not, you've probably seen the spectacular highlight reel footage of what fans of the sport call the big one. The big one is seen in its worst form at super speedways like Daytona and Talladega, and those massive pileups are spectacular, but they're remarkable also for their ability of drivers to generally climb out of that wreckage unharmed. Now it's an engineering achievement, created through 70 years of progressive rule changes by the governing body to make the vehicle safer. Fatalities are rare in stock car racing today, and this year saw the debut of what NASCAR calls the next-gen car, a radical change in the sport's operating principles. In the past, individual teams either built cars in their own shops, or bought chassis and engines from other shops and prepared them for competition. Some preparers became legendary in the sport. Petty Engineering, the Wood Brothers, Holman and Moody, and a few others dominated the sport, and they fed parts and cars to other competitors. The next-gen car is a fundamental change. It's a spec car, built by a single manufacturer and purchased by the teams as a complete chassis. The last vestiges of production car technology, namely sheet steel bodies and five lug wheel hubs, are gone, and the sport has moved to the high technology scene in international sports car racing. The cars are also significantly stiffer, which is great news for engineers and crew chiefs when setting up the car, but it has also added a new safety issue for drivers, concussion. Now head injuries are nothing new in NASCAR. The sport's leading driver, Dale Earnhardt, was killed by a basal skull fracture in the 2001 Daytona 500 in a relatively minor crash, a tragedy which drove the widespread adoption of head and neck restraints in all forms of motorsports. The Hans device, combined with very strong seats that hold the driver and the driver's head in position during a violent wreck, have helped, but today's stiff car, even with softer racetrack walls, better helmets, and custom seats, is still delivering impact decelerations that are causing serious concussions. Alex Bowman has been eliminated from playoff contention due to five races missed after a concussion suffered in Texas. Kurt Busch has had his career essentially ended due to concussions sustained in the new car. Careers cut short due to head injuries are not new in the sport. Ernie Irvin, Steve Park, Bobby Allison, and other outstanding drivers have suffered career-ending brain injuries at the highest level of the sport. But the next-gen car was designed with the latest technology, so what's going on? Well, in motorsports, a stiff chassis is a good chassis. It allows precision suspension setup with fewer variables due to unintended rates induced by bending modes in the structure. And in some types of collision, a secure roll cage does protect the driver, especially in rollovers and flips. But encapsulating the driver and immobilizing him or her doesn't address the fundamental problem of a very stiff structure. Acceleration, or more specifically, deceleration of the driver's head and the brain sloshing into the inside of the skull as a result. There is no way to remediate that problem by strapping the driver in tighter into a stronger seat. The only solution is to decrease the g-forces of impact, and as every first-year student knows, the equations of distance, velocity, acceleration, and third derivative forces, sometimes called jerk, are dependent on delta v and the distance over which that velocity goes to zero. Now soft walls help, but something has to deflect to allow the driver's head to decelerate more slowly. Either the chassis structure has to deform, as it does in production cars for this purpose, or the seat must be redesigned to yield a little, either through deformable structures, shear bolts with captive lanyards, or some form of spring mounting. I suspect that even two or three inches of seat movement may be enough to significantly reduce the G-loading on driver's skulls. Designing seats that move inside the roll cage is completely counterintuitive to everyone, from Hendrick Motorsports to guys like me with my stick welder, but the physics are irrefutable. NASCAR designed a very strong car that can take a hit and keep on driving. Now that creates exciting racing, but no sport can keep ending its star's careers through injury. NASCAR really doesn't have very many options here. Either make the chassis structures more deformable or allow the seats to move a little. Neither will require an extensive redesign of the next-gen car. And I suspect one or both of those solutions are going to be seen in the sport before next February's Daytona 500. Well, that's it for today's episode of End of the Line, brought to you by engineering.com. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell for our next episode. 
For our deeper engineering video series for the manufacturing professional, visit engineering.com TV to watch exclusive shows like Manufacturing the Future, not found here on our YouTube channel. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching.